put off by how long this video is. Don't worry, I try to jam pack my videos with as much content and as much detail as I possibly can. Anything I feel I can comment on and that I feel you might be interested in, I pretty much put in the video. I try not to repeat myself and talk fairly fast. If the video is too long for you, I have recorded a shorter version and the link will be in the description box. FX2 Movie Review Former special effects expert, or X SFX XP if you will, Raleigh Tyler is now a toy maker, although just about the only example we see of his new craft is a man-sized sort of robotic clown doll with I will be extremely convenient written all over it. Basically, it's if you put on this kind of control suit, then when you move your arms and legs, it will do the exact same. And yeah, you know, he, he even points out how expensive of a toy that's going to be, but yeah. Mike, the ex-husband of his girlfriend Kim, is a cop, and he asks Raleigh's help to catch a killer. You know, using his skills within the field of special effects. And at first he says no, and then with nothing else happening in the film, he says, and I quote, Why not? And I, I would pose as an answer to that question, I would submit as an answer to that question, the rest of the movie. And then the rest of the movie comes, it, it pretty much reinforces, it. The, the movie then goes out of its way to prove why he should have said no. Yeah, the, the operation goes well until an unknown man kills Mike and the, the, the killer himself ends up dead as well. Now, Mike's boss, Silek, insists that the, it was the killer who killed Mike, so there's a good chance that he's involved. And Raleigh senses a setup and with you know, at least one cop being in on it, a high-placed cop at that. Yeah, the, it's... He can't say how much corruption is on the force, so he, you know, he gets the help of Leo, who was a cop in the first movie and who's now a private investigator. And they find that Silek may not be the only... Yeah, the, the only person that they have to deal with. Raleigh will, of course, once again have to get by the way he's, you know, gotten by before, using special effects to trick the unsuspecting eye. Right off the bat, the FX experience isn't really a part of the plot. It's something that's added on to it. But the, the, the sting operation, stakeout kind of thing could easily have been done without the, the help of the special effects. Basically, it's that the the person who's actually in there, rather than the woman who's being watched. Because obviously, if someone is watching a woman, if, you know, if you're a voyeur, obviously you're also a sadistic murderer. It's just not unlike how the homosexual is in fact also a pedophile rapist. Yeah, not to say that no one who kills also, you know, is a voyeur, but it's hardly a one-to-one -one kind of thing. Yeah, basically, the woman who he thinks he's watching 
it you know actually leaves the the place you know knowing that she's being watched and instead the person who's in there waiting is Mike Mike having been made up to look like a woman to the not too discerning eye and yeah I'd 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 comment on how borderline transphobic that that is but I rather than doing that I would just point out that the very opening literally the the very first quote unquote joke or what have you is literally a really ugly transphobic joke so yeah why did it have to be Mike? Why couldn't it have been a woman who could defend herself? This is, you know, heck, give her a gun if that's the part that you think is really critical. It doesn't have to be Mike. Are there no female cops that, that they could... I, the movie has Rachel Tacodin. I'm sorry. Rachel Tacodin could kick this guy's ass. No problem. And it's just, it's it's so forced to get Raleigh in there. Anyway, basically, yeah, Raleigh is, he's written into a typical major character murdered, corruption, so we have to hide while we find out what's really going on, and maybe there's even a conspiracy, and... Yeah, there's there's no reason for Raleigh to be here. The the plot is bigger and complex. I, I'm not going to say more complex because really the, in the first one the, the plot is very straightforward. You you know there are twists along the way, but every twist is just oh like that. Okay, sure. You know it, there's there's not that much to it, which is fine. It works quite well. And this time the there is no pointless cop cop subplot leo actually matters this time now it's raleigh that's completely unnecessarily written into this is a cop movie this is you know it's it's borderline a buddy cop movie but you know there, there are certainly buddy elements which you know the first one wasn't a buddy movie at all but yeah the, there's no reason for raleigh to be here his character <sighs> bunch of the time could have been combined with Leo, but sure, you want to have two, you know, male protagonists make the other guy a cop. That's it. That's that's all you have to do. There's nothing Raleigh brings to this that would... He even, at times, screws things up by not being very smart, in spite of how, you know, him being... You would think he had learned a lot from, from the first time. I mean, that's even... That's maybe even part of why he turns, you know, yeah, turns it down this time. And, you know, the whole him having moral issues with what's going on in the first one, forget about that. Here, there's none of that. And, yeah, you know, I on the IMDb board, someone suggested that really when Leo enters the first movie, you know, Brian Denny steals the first movie. I agree, but it wasn't his to steal. He has no business being in that movie. There's no reason for there to be a major cop character in that movie at all. And here, this is his movie, and Raleigh doesn't even come close to stealing it. It's just... Yeah. And the... Although, although you know, it is maybe a good thing that it's not a cop, because the cops in this, especially when they draw guns, are surprisingly incompetent. I mean, I mean, I would make a joke comparing them to, like, today's trigger-happy cops, but I don't even, the, the joke makes itself. Just, yeah, watch watch the scenes in the movie where, where cops pull guns, and it's like, <laughs> I guess it has been worse than it is these days. There's your joke about it. And uh, I have not watched the TV series, this movie is basically about showing off gadgets. It's not really, yeah. The the and as others have pointed out, it's basically a big screen routine cop show, and just 
yeah, I mean, I, I could easily see this being a just a straightforward, just purely cop film. It's, it's, yeah. And as one reviewer in, in particular pointed out, the movie rarely makes sense and the climax is utterly incomprehensible. That's absolutely spot on. Now, some have said that this is Brian Brown's best performance. I, I probably watched Cocktail years ago, but I don't remember it. These, you know, the effects movies are the only ones I remember him from. You know, I'm not sure I've watched many others of his movies. Now, Brian Denny is good as ever as this, you know, tough cop who just yeah, pushes hard to get the the to, to get his way to get the the to get the job done, and you know, yeah, you know your classic '80s cop who doesn't play by the rules, and he's fun as it. You know, there there were a ton of these characters in the '80s, and as this early '90s, but yeah, then he was always you know is always fun to watch, and. His answering machine, uh, yeah, the the message that you know, not a message left on it, but the the answering machine response is probably the funniest bit in this whole thing, and it, yeah, he he gives a great performance as always, and he and you know, in in the first, it, Raleigh has this kind of prank, you know, it's very sarcastic streak to him. And in this, Leo has some of that too, so they can have some of that together. And they, they, they are fun together. They, you know, they don't agree on, you know, they have very different, I mean, they're both, you could maybe say that Raleigh plays it more safe and, and gets more creative and Leo, he has sort of, you know, he's been doing this for ages, and he's good at it. And, yeah, he's going to break the rules. But, yeah, it's it's very much a cop thing, a cop, cop instincts and cop methods. You know, he goes directly and, you know, well, it is also, Raleigh tries to not attract too much attention to himself because Silak actually knows him and doesn't want him to you know dig too deep. Leo, they don't, you know, you know, they don't know him. So he has more of a you know, he can actually go out and get these kind of things. Yeah. Actually, yeah. Replace Raleigh. I mean, I maintain that the first movie, if you just cut out the cop subplot, the movie is much tighter and just, you, you won't even notice that it's missing. And the ending, that should have been Andy, and I will never forgive the movie for it not being Andy. But in this one, it's, it's Raleigh who could easily be, I, I would say, yes, replace him have it be that he's part of the stakeout because he insists on being. Silak doesn't really want him there. Here it doesn't make sense that Silak even allows him to be there if he has some interest in Raleigh not realizing what's going on. Anyway, have him be the, the guy who picked the woman who does, because, I'm sorry, that could just easily have been, and have him be like, part of it and then he you know has a personal state I mean sure there's the thing about you know the ex and the whole they 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 try so hard I mean just the the plot is that the the Raleigh the protagonist his girlfriend who isn't a very big part of it kid father who's the ex-husband is a cop and is really about him it's just, yeah, heck, make the girlfriend the protagonist. That would, 
that would have made a ton more sense. Any anyway, yeah, the you know they 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 actually spend scenes together in this, and yeah, they're they're fun together, and. You know, they, they were both rich by the end of the, the first one. And, you know, you might say that, that that might be why, you know, Raleigh can work on these really expensive toys. And, you know, Leo being a PI, you know, if you're a cop for, for years, then, you know, you don't really want to stop completely, but he didn't. He's not on the force anymore as of the first one, so yeah. But but yeah, Rachel Tacoden is the, the girlfriend here, you know, known from Total Recall, the running man. Blink and you'll miss her, she's in not quite that, but yeah, she's in Con Air. She doesn't get to be tough here. She and the kid are basically just they they barely matter. They're really a liability. There, there's someone that, you know, Raleigh has to defend. If Raleigh didn't have to protect these two, again, the only way he matters in the film is because he has to protect the, the two of them. And, yeah, she's nowhere near as interesting or fun as Ellen, the actress girlfriend, in the first one. The, the two of them barely even get closure. I, I don't know if... I feel like the last scene with them was cut from the film because it's ridiculous. The the last scene with them in this, just the, the way it leaves them. I'm, I'm not saying that we needed to know exactly what happens after that with them, but the movie gives them no closure. They, yeah, they feel like they were written in to give, some, give Raleigh something to do because he's not doing that much to investigate. It's not... Yeah, it's it's a cop movie that happens to have, you know, this, this guy who... So they have to make up stuff for him to do. None of which is out of the, you know... They would have had to rewrite how he deals with bad guys. But that's it. It could easily have been a cop. And the and and you know Takoda also isn't in this. I, I hope that's how you pronounce it. I, I don't know of him, but she she's great, and especially in the '80s, she was badass. And uh, yeah, you you miss the the supporting cast of the first one. And to be fair, not all of them could exactly return, but yes, she's it's not a good performance, but. Martha Gaiman, Gaiman as Andy, the, the soul of the first film, and just such a, yeah, just so, such a fun part of the first one, you know, the late, great Jerry Orbach, always amazing, Tom Noonan, although not used to his full, like, potential, although they do give him some, you know, he's, He's basically a goon, and yeah, it's it's a it's basically that he he has to look shady, and he does. You know, I mean, yeah, he, that that is something he can do, and he can look infinitely shadier than he did in that. But yeah. This takes itself more seriously than the first one, which was, yeah, just lighter and more, yeah, just more enjoyable. The, that was the thing that most struck me upon this viewing of this. It's just not that fun to watch. It's not that engaging or interesting. It's not technically bad. The, the plot, I mean... You can follow it, and it all, you know, lines up, and, but there's just no reason to care. It's not personal. 
and it yeah in the first one the, the movie was specifically about Raleigh it couldn't really be you know they 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 needed him they needed his work and then he finds that his work was you know maybe abused or used against him or something and yeah there's a, i mean in in this it doesn't there's not that much of a reason for him to be that afraid of for example silac it I don't, yeah, yeah. Just the the threat isn't as distinct as in the first, and yeah, it's it's not personal for either of the protagonists, really. It you know a, a little bit for Raleigh again because you know there is that relationship with you know yeah, but but if not for the girlfriend, he wouldn't know or care about my or and the kid. I keep almost not mentioning the kid. When you go to IMDb and read like the synopsis and such, the kid isn't even mentioned. You could basically write the kid entirely out of this movie and you wouldn't really lose anything. And the 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 humor is decent. The but but yeah, and it is you know fairly typical kind of '80s, early '90s action flick, and the the action can still be you know quite creative. Although a lot of the time here it does kind of boil down to Raleigh uses a lighter on something, and or the the aforementioned toy robot and in order to do a satisfying part two you have to get part one you have to understand what made it special why did it connect with people and this is one of countless sequels that just do not get part one the you know the tactic use of special effects is still there but it tries so hard to outdo part one's special effects that it ends up just a series of gags and most of them just seem way more effort than they're worth which is completely backwards of the minimalist and really effective use in part one in, in this he has access to things that I'm like where did he get that and he has just an insane amount of it as well where yeah in the first it felt like everything he had he had just that one because he wasn't like able to go and get like in this it basically feels like he's been you know working towards this for a long time like he has a lab and you know can mass produce stuff where, yeah, in the first, it felt like he had one of each thing, and he had to very carefully plan when to use it and how to use it. And Yeah, there are, there are times in the first where it's like, how did he manage to get all of that to the, you know, how could he carry all of that and place it and such? And, and in both, for sure, he gets ridiculously lucky, and he somehow knows. It's, it's like... A stealth game. Somehow he can tell where the the goons are gonna go and when and such, and how to best trick them. And sometimes they'll also be really stupid and go along the, in in this especially though. But yeah, and the yeah they're just not as creative or entertaining this time around. I don't really know this director from much. I it's been too long since I watched Cloak and Dagger, but I want to say that that is a good movie. What I do know he's directed is this and Psycho 2. And while Psycho 2 is infinitely worse than this, it is 
both are completely unnecessary second parts to series that didn't need second parts and just are nowhere near up to the quality of the the first you know it, i mean psycho 2 it's really the the you know slow down to watch a car crash kind of thing it's like i mean it's, I'm, i imagine a bunch of you just did a double take did he say psycho 2 how is there more than how how did they do a follow up to psycho and and trust you don't you probably don't want to know but like me you might be just just curious just want to see and yeah it is an utterly impeccable crash it's it's just yeah you know money talks and thus we get sequels that try really hard to outdo the first one when yeah I have watched you know I've, I've watched these at least three times these two and where on each subsequent viewing of the well yeah, I rewatched the first one just yesterday so that's at least four times but on each subsequent viewing of the first one I recognize a ton of it and yeah with part two here I just I don't recognize or remember much of it at all cinematography and editing are average or better the action is pretty nicely done you know if you go into this just wanting action it, it delivers I, I would say maybe one or two scenes go on for too long but yeah and it is you know there is suspense although it's nowhere near as engaging or thrilling as part one and the the opening of both of these movies are there is a similarity to them but in the first one it really works in this one it's way too over the top and you almost immediately just it doesn't work there, there are movies in the 80s and early 90s that do this kind of thing and yeah some of them really really work and if it wouldn't be spoiling both those movies and these two I might go into more detail you know once you've watched at least one of these you know what I'm talking about and until then I don't want to spoil it this is probably the the worst of them and I it's it it's really quite baffling it I they did not understand part one plain and simple they did not understand what made the first one really work and yeah it's just it's it's also noteworthy that the note that the the scene ends on in part one is really compelling and really interesting and I suppose yeah it's not giving too much away that in the first one really it it sets the plot in motion that the the yeah in this it just kind of says that the 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 thing that that you want to see in this movie might not be in the movie and as as much as you you know yeah this is still the character remember from the first movie but he's he says he's not interested so and and that's just they also make him a little bit more of a jerk I mean he, he wasn't exactly an angel in the first one he was he was a likable slight jerk you know he could he could be a little bit of an ass at times but yeah it's it's a sequel thing where especially with movies that were like comedic in some way the sequel will make the main character kind of a jerk because it's it's easier to when 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 you have a main character who's nice you have to construct sequences that put him in 
a comedic situation. It's easy to write a comedic situation with a jerk because the jerk goes into the situation and is a jerk. And then we're either laughing, you know, mean spiritedly at his victims or we're laughing at him in, you know, maybe, maybe he's a jerk, but he gets some comeuppance or, yeah, but yeah, it's just, yeah. I've read other parts of this franchise, the links are in the description box. Please comment, thumbs up, and subscribe for more content.